คือว่าจะมีการบาดเจ็บเกิดขึ้นถ้าเกิดออกไปออกกำลังกายหนักมากแล้วก็เวลาที่เยอะขึ้นมันก็จะมีเทรนออกตรงเรื่องของการบาดเจ็บเกิดขึ้นนะครับ Our most basic rules when it comes to assigning workloads is that you only assign one at a time ก็เขาบอกว่ากฎในการ assign workload ก็คือให้ assign ทีละทีละครั้งที่เราเข้ามานะครับวันใดละทาง You've stated before that intensity, frequency, and duration are all overloads. And when you apply when you apply an overload, if you choose among those, you choose one at a time, one only. ก็ที่เรารู้กันนะครับก็จะมี intensity นะครับ duration นะครับพวกกลุ่มพวกนี้เป็น overload งั้นเวลาจะเลือก o k s ให้เลือกอย่างใดไม่ไม่ต้องขึ้นทั้งสองสามอย่างในเวลาเดียวกัน If you apply more than one at the same time, there's two problems you have. One, you can't differentiate between them as to uh, what caused the result of your training, whether it be good or bad. And when you add excessive overloads, the body has to try to adapt to those, and one of the results is failure. เขามันถ้ามันมีเอ็กซ์ซิสโอเวอร์โหลดคือมีมากเป็นไปครับมันผลก็คือทำให้เกิดการเฟลเดียร์ที่ลบเองนะครับ So if you're doing a, a running program and this week you're doing two miles a day and you're running at 20 at uh, seven minutes per kilometer and you say well I'm gonna make it more difficult next week so you go up to three kilometers and you go up to eight kilometers per per Minute, eight minutes per kilometer. That would be uh, a big mistake because you're adding two overloads at the same time. เราก็ยกตัวอย่างของการวิ่งครับจะเพิ่มบริยาทางหรือเพิ่มความเร็วครับสองอย่างขึ้นมาครับตอนแรกพูดเป็นเป็นไมล์ตอนหลังเป็นกิโลก็สักสองไมล์จะเพิ่มเป็นสี่กิโลนะฮะหรือว่าจะเพิ่มความเร็วเพิ่มเพสนะครับก็ถ้าอย่างเงี้ยมันโอเวอร์โหลดมันจะเกินไปก็ไม่รู้ว่าตัวไหนเป็นสิ่งที่ดีเนี่ยให้เพิ่มทีละอย่าง So add one at a time. Wait to see the effect before adding another overload. This is the different types of uh, workouts that a that an athlete will do for aerobic power. อันนี้ก็เป็นตารางประเภทของการออกกำลังกายครับในของแอโรบิกซึ่งจะมีประเภทแตกต่างกัน You need to be familiar with these names and uh, what they exactly mean. Okay, เราจะต้องจำพวกชื่อพวกนี้ให้ได้ครับว่ามันมันคืออะไรให้คุณเคยชื่อพวกนี้ครับแล้วว่ามันใช้ทำอะไร Someone says they're doing a tempo run that has a very specific meaning. They're doing intervals, very specific meaning. LSD, very specific meaning. ก็เหมือนถ้ามาวันใครไปที่เวิร์กเป็นเทมโพรันนะครับก็จะมีตัวแน่ครับก็มีเทมโพมี LSD มีอินเทอร์วอลแล้วมันใช้ทำอะไรเพื่อที่จะทำอินเทนซิตี้ Long slow distance is typically routinely almost universally done once a week. A runner will do an extra long their longest run of the week one time a week and it will be at a relatively slow pace maybe a minute or two above Race pace. And LSD long slow distance going very very up. I have to do a lot of work. If it's a day, I do a lot of work. At the end of the day, I do a lot of work. I do a lot of work. If you look at the intensity more specifically, it looks like about 70% of VO2 max. And as we've been looking, that's just near the aerobic threshold. Because the anaerobic threshold is, as we use that term today. ก็ถ้าเป็น LSD ก็ intensity ก็ประมาณ 70% ของ VO2 max นะครับ Each one of these training training types are basically getting more and more difficult as a percentage of max VO2. Pace tempo is at lactate threshold, or it is at the pace in which you can maintain, or the fastest pace you can maintain during a race. ถ้าเป็นถ้าตามตารางไล่ลงมาครับก็จะความก็มากขึ้นเรื่อยๆครับเพสเทมโพเนี่ยก็จะเป็นที่ไลเซชเชโชนะครับหรือว่าเป็นช่วงที่เพสของที่การแข่งขันเวสเพสนะครับโอเวสเพส
intervals that you do for aerobic training are typically between three and five minutes long, and they're done at close to max field two. So they're very, they're very challenging. The idea is that after it takes a minute or two to get up to steady state, steady state VO2, and then the last minute or two are going to really stimulate your um, adaptation in the aerobic system. The rest works of rest interval is a one to one. So if you do a three minute a three minute repetition, you got what we consider a complete rest. Then the three minutes. Uh, however, it's not it's not um, allow you to get all the way back to baseline. It allows you to return close to it, so that when you start the next interval, you'll be already have a head start in getting back up to that that sweet spot in which you. Maximally overloading VO2. The next most difficult is HIIT. Okay, what you do, um, just a, around a minute or so, a little less, a little bit more, with a work to rest ratio of 1 to 5. Because there's so much more rest, you know that it's a lot more difficult. Again, it depends on the depends on the athlete, their training history, their, their ability to tolerate the, the uh, where they are in their in their training year. A lot of different variables as to how what kind of volume you, you attach to that. This is just the intensity that you would use. Just a general person. Yes. If you're going to be doing interval training to, to improve max VO2, if you do a, a three-minute rep or three-minute uh, exercise bout, you're going to get benefit with uh, two or three reps. And if you, I mean, try it, see what happens. But after three or four, you're pretty spent. And if you do three, you're at you're stimulating max VO2 for maybe. Uh, Four minutes total, and if you think about the Tabata protocol, you spend what? How many? Twenty minutes times eight, a little over two minutes, and you get a great effect. So if you're trying to increase VO2 using intervals, you know, two or three reps is plenty to, to get you get you going. And the, and the normal person, I mean, the one just interested in general fitness, aren't going to be doing HIIT training anyway. I mean, this is, this is greater than VO2 max, so um, you can't supply your energy from the, from the aerobic system. So it's got to be, it's got to be anaerobic, which is very painful, and most people don't use those systems on a regular basis. When you go for a jog, you don't talk, you don't stress your uh, lactate system much. Now you might use fartlek training. Fartlek is also called speed play. Okay. And that's where you just uh, alternate running at LSD or a slow pace with periods in which you speed things up. And that, that speed up could be uh, a few seconds, um, 
to a couple minutes at varying intensities based upon your training goals. possibilities for Farleks as far as um, pace and alternating work and rest. And that's what it is the whole time. You're alternating working hard and resting. LSD and then tempo is uh, a routine way to do Farleks. <laughs> Key, the key point to me is the alternating in difficulty. 
you start off with a far left run, and that's usually pretty low, low key. The next day is LSD, another recovery type day. Before you get to the more difficult, the most difficult interval training, pace is a little less, more, a little less difficult. Repetition's tough. So you've got three very difficult days in a row before you have the relatively easier long run. Pace training is just what it sounds. You're trying to imitate the pace that you want to maintain during competition. And what you're going to focus on is trying to race faster. So things you're going to try to think about and do during the during the workout is just, the whole idea is to try to increase the lactate threshold. Because again, pace at lactate threshold determines how fast you run. And to increase your ability to run fast. Running well is going to make it easier to take the energy you have and convert it into forward motion. And this is always below or less than the race distance. Uh, if, you, if you try to do tempo at the race distance, at your chosen race distance, the result is going to be overtraining, not uh, adaptation. Title is there doesn't uh, really is not appropriate. I don't know why it's like that. Interval training and tempo training are two different things. So that title should be interval training and interval training. Now, if you're trying to increase VO2 max, once again the distance or the time that you spend is key. We've seen this before. If my goal is to is to repeat VO2 max, when I start, there's going to be a time before I get up to VO2 max, and that's, we have a deficit there. As during this period, if this is three minutes. During this period, from here to here, you're having the, you're you're applying the stimulus required ask the body to adapt and get better. So you might spend, you know, one to two minutes under under the appropriate stresses needed to, to increase VO2. ที่เขาเป็นการที่เขาคุยกันเมื่อวานครับเขาเวลาที่ <coughs> And if you try to go much longer than four or five minutes, it's just too hard. And your your pace is going to slow down, you're going to start accumulating a lot of lactate, and you're not going to be at VO2 max. So, so the ideal uh, length of the intervals is between three and five minutes. He says it can be as short as 30 to 45 seconds, but that's just not true. It has to be at least, it has to be at least a minute before we can get to the O2 max. And he said that the length of the time is between 30 to 45 minutes, but he said that it's not true. 
ไม่น่าจะใช่ก็น่าจะมาในสิ่งกับที่เจ้านะครับ And depending on the leak, but if it's a five minute, if it's a five minute uh, uh, repeat, you can go to one to one work ratio, work to rest work ratio. A little shorter, it's going to be that makes it a little more difficult. So you need a little bit more rest. It might be a one to three ratio. Since interval training should be used sparingly, and only when training athletes with a firm aerobic endurance training base, uh, it depends on the sport. In reality, I mean, for runners, intervals are very challenging because of the stress on the legs. Swimmers use intervals every single day. Uh, they don't have the eccentric component to their muscle muscle contractions, so they can tolerate the interval training a lot better. เขาบอกว่าอันนี้ก็อยู่ที่กีฬาด้วยครับระหว่างวิ่งกับว่ายน้ำสมมติถ้าเป็นวิ่งเอ่อจะมีตัวถ้าเป็นว่ายน้ำ
you're thinking of interval training, this, this uh, table is what you need to have in your head. Okay, this is where you start. This is the model you begin with. And the work to rest ratio depends upon the energy system that you're overloading. Uh, and you can put it more to it, not even more than the share she share cut, go back to that. ที่เราต้องระวังแต่มันใช้เทรนเวอร์เรสเรชโชเป็นเท่าไหร่เมื่อกี้เหมือนการพูดอย่างต่อยี่สิบอยู่ในมือไฟประมาณอย่างเงี้ยเนื้อจะเป็นการวนสุดเลยนะครับมาซิมาพาวเวอร์ขึ้นอยู่กับระบบการที่เราใช้งาน It has the energy system rate ranked according to their power capabilities. Plus, with the highest down to up to date. Your typical exercise time has to do with how, what the capacity of that energy system is. If you're going to overload the phosphorus system, there's only the capacity of it's only 10 seconds. And to get a complete resynthesis, resynthesis of the, the phosphorus, you need two or three minute rest. And so we get a one to 12 or one to 20 ratio. You do a 10 second rep, a one to 12 ratio, is a two minute rest, which kind of makes sense. Now, fast glycolysis is what we usually think about when we're running 200 meters, or racing 200 meters, or 400 meters. Uh, so we think of the time, you know, 20 seconds, 45 seconds for world class. So the capacity of that system is, is roughly a minute, 45 seconds. So the typical exercise time in your intervals, and you're trying to improve your fast glycolytic system, 15 to 30 seconds, lots of lactate produced, so you need to keep yourself in simple rest, one to three, one to five. Uh, if you fast uh, uh, wind, two hundred, 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 two two should make sense if the first two made sense. Product training is usually not as intense as other types of training, but it has some good reason to do it. And a grand idea of fartlek training is that if you sum all the interval work bouts that you do during the fartlek, it should total the, the ultimate distance that you're going to race at. As a topic, pop in fartlek training, you have any good idea? Call, put it on like in the last song, the car. Oh, wow, LSD, yes, a little long distance, my car. Got to a home, speed, my car, speed. It says it can be adapted to cycling and swimming training programs. I'm sure it could, but I, I've never heard of it or seen it. I've only seen it in, uh, in runners. Okay, one stop there. Take just a short break while I get the slide for nutrition. As they present it. 
ที่เขามองมาก็เหมือนกับหนังสือนะครับที่หลายนิ้วก็บอกสำหรับเขาก็จะแปลกๆหน่อยครับ The first thing we're talking about is how many calories does, a, does a, an athlete need, and we get some some numbers here. This is a recreational athlete. Uh, by the way, they're going to use uh, three different types, three different levels of athlete when they're talking about all the different nutrients uh, in this chapter. We got the recreational athlete, we got the moderate intensity athlete, then we got the elite athlete. <laughs> ถ้าในในที่เขาใช้นะครับก็จะมีนักกีฬาอยู่สามอันที่สามประเภทก็เขาจะแบ่งเป็น recreation and athletic ครับที่แบบเล่นทั่วไปนะครับสายนั้นธนาคารสุภาพแล้วก็เป็น moderate แล้วก็เป็น elite มีอยู่สามส่วนในเวลาเจอข้อสอบก็อ่านให้ดี So most most of us are going to fit in this area right here probably uh, others in this one but for a normal uh, healthy adult These are the type of numbers that we're looking at. So the number of calories we're looking for per day, they're using kilograms per day, suggesting 25 to 30 to get your 1,824 <coughs> Now there's a lot of variation here. You got 25 to 35 calories, and then it has for 50 to 80 kilogram individual. And those that's a very wide range. And for me, I can't remember those numbers. But when I'm trying to estimate what someone needs for a uh, number of calories, I use 30, 30 times body weight. So I guess that is uh, 30 kilocalories per kilogram to come up with the uh, energy requirement for, for the individual. I find if I use that number, it's close enough. I mean, there's no way we can actually precisely tell how many calories we bring in, and as well as we can't really tell precisely how many calories that we expend. But if I start with a number like 30, 30, kilo, or 30 calories per kilogram per day, then I can go either way based upon uh, change in body weight, This athlete is a two, three hours a day. That's pretty serious, if you ask me. But uh, and the difference is going to be the increased number of calories needed per kilogram. Calories are going to come from uh, the expenditure during exercise. I mean, at rest, there will be a little higher because of the epoch, but, uh, but most of this difference is going to be the number of calories during exercise. Here, you're only doing a couple hundred calories a day. Here, you're doing three or four times that. Recreation ประมาณ 2,400 แต่พอเป็นตัวของวัตถุเองขึ้นเป็น 600,000 ถึง 
athlete. I mean, I, I looked all over trying to figure out where they came up with that number and tried to do calculations, estimations, but 12,000 calories a day. The highest I ever saw uh, reporting a number of calories that a Tour de France rider did was 7,000. And there's no such thing as an 80 kilogram <coughs> Tour de France rider. นี่เขาบอกว่าที่เขาดูเขาก็พยายามจะทำมาก็ในหนังสืออันนี้เนี่ยจาก This is from the book เลยในหนังสือเขียนว่าประมาณเป็นสองกิโลแคลต่อวันที่จะหาไปได้ประมาณเจ็ดพันนะครับแล้วก็เขาก็บอกว่าอย่างที่เมื่อวานจะเล่าว่านักจักรยานจะไม่ค่อยน้ำหนักตัวเยอะเท่าไหร่ครับว่าเยอะแต่นี้มันถึงแปดสิบกิโลแล้วก็ถ้าเราไปกันแคลอรี่ต่อกิโลนี่ดูนี่เราได้25 35แล้วเราได้40 70แล้วถ้าเราใช้แคลอรี่ 12,000 คาลอรี่ต่อวันสำหรับ150กิโลกรัมอาทิตย์นั่นคูณกับ80แคลอรี่ต่อกิโลกรัมก็นี่ถ้าเราดูตัวแคลอรี่นะครับตัวนี้มันจะเป็น150 200กิโลกรัมก็เท่ากับเอาไปหารดูนี่เยอะ So that increase in daily calorie requirement is, is primarily a factor of uh, the exercise they do each day. Her light is about 20% lighter, and for the women, these numbers are all 90% of what the men are. That difference has to do with the fact that females typically have more fat than males do, and you don't need to feed fat. Nutritionists typically, uh, when they're de designing uh, diets for, for patients, they're going to be most interested in the percentage of your three major macronutrients, carbs, protein, and fats. These percentages are going to vary according to who's ever, who's ever relating them to you. But when I'm thinking about the, the typical uh, ratio among carbohydrate, protein, and fat, I think, I think of 50, 30, 20. 50% carbohydrates, 20% um, protein, 30% fat. Just use that as a hook, as a starting point, and then you can adjust those according to circumstances. 
ก็ใช้อันนี้เป็นเหมือนกับเป็นไกด์ไลน์ครับเสร็จแล้วก็ให้ปรับเอาไอ้ที่เราต้องมีต้องรีบเอาไปกิโลกรัมกรัมต่อกิโลกรัมต่อวันเพราะถ้าคุณเอาเปอร์เซ็นต์จากที่ทั้งหมดคาลอรี่ที่คุณสูงที่สุดในวันคุณสามารถจดจำได้ไม่ต้องจำตัวข้างหลังแล้วถ้าเราดูเปอร์เซ็นต์เราสามารถคำนวณได้ว่าเปอร์เซ็นต์ที่เราต้องการมีความเน้นมันจะออกมาในสัดส่วนเป็นเท่าไหร่เกณฑ์เต็มคุณต้องจำได้จริงๆต้องทำ How much protein does it actually need? I believe it's protein. No, it's carbohydrates. I'm sorry. We got three levels again. We got the normal man, three to five grams per kilogram per day. The moderate athlete is five to eight grams per kilogram per day, and the elite athlete, eight to ten grams per kilogram. And the level, ah, man, man, he. ถ้าเป็นมาเรทกับไทยของนักกีฬาอินเดสตี้ช่วงต้องฝึก 2-3 สาชั่วโมงต่อสัปดาห์อันนี้ก็ต้องการอย่างน้อย 5-8 กรัมต่อกิโลกรัมต่อวันนะครับถ้าเป็นไทยวอลลุ่มอินเทนส์เขาบอกว่าคิดว่ามันเป็นอินเดสตี้นะครับก็ประมาณ 8-10 กรัมต่อวันถ้าเราเลือกเลือกสเปกตรมของผู้ชายผู้หญิงฉันพบในการทดลองว่าถ้าผมจำได้พวกนี้4 6และ9ฉันสามารถตอบได้ทุกคำถามที่ถูกถามเกี่ยวกับเท่าไหร่ของผู้ชายผู้หญิงที่มีความสูงขึ้นก็เขาบอกว่าจะเป็นตัวเลข35อันนี้ก็เป็นกับเป็น recreation athlete นะครับจริงๆก็คือ recreation จะแบบฝึกไม่ไม่ไม่เยอะมากนะเขาเป็น moderate ก็เป็น5ถึง8หรือ8ถึง10แกก็บอกว่าให้จำ4 6 9นะครับหมวดนี้จะออก4 6 9ครับก็ถ้าถ้าตามตัวนี้เขาบอกเขาสามารถประมาณการได้นะครับว่าในของคาร์บอนไฮเดรตครับจะพูดถึง I apply these numbers to a lot of different instances, a lot of different cases, a lot of different uh, uh, exam type questions that I found on the internet and uh, here, here and there. And it always seemed to, he always seemed to work very well. If you start with those numbers right now, as you get more intimate with uh, with nutrient needs, with nutrition, then the three might make more sense to you, or the five might make more sense. So then you can start remembering the three to five because you have something to peg it to. But until you get a lot of experience with these things, four, six, nine is a good way to memorize it. เราอาจจะไปจัดเล่นที่มันเป็นช่วงแบบ3ถึง5เนี่ยแต่ตอนนี้เอาง่ายๆเราก็จัด10ปี6 9ก็ก็4ก็เป็นพวก recreation 6ก็ปั่นการ9ก็ high intensity นะครับเป็น elite athletes the next macronutrient we're looking at is protein นี่ก็เป็นโปรตีนนะครับ and I start with one, one and a half, and two. One is a recreational athlete. One, one kilogram, one uh, gram of protein per kilogram body weight per day. One and a half is uh, someone who's a little bit more serious. And the elite, 2.0. Recreation, moderate, elite, 1 gram per kilogram body weight. So here's a moderate, here's the guidelines for moderate athlete. 
one to two, one point two to two grams per day. If you use the 1.5 as your starting point, it fits within that range. Same thing with the uh, advanced athlete, 1.7 to 2.2, 2 fits nicely in that range as well. We talked about high quality pro proteins the other day. Easy way to remember it. High quality proteins come from animals. Low quality from plants. NPS, muscle protein synthesis. We try to increase muscle, muscle mass or maintain muscle mass. Uh, the best time to get it in is right after your exercise. Now if you're building muscle mass, you probably need a little bit more protein. So we have it suggesting to take a 1.4 to 2.0 grams per kilogram per day. And the, the key here is sufficient for most exercising individuals. You know, some, you know, a normal, a normal human being on this planet anymore doesn't exercise. So the exercising individual is going to, I'm going to put them in the moderate category, one and a half gram per kilogram, that fits within that range. The next one, higher protein intakes, two to three grams per kilogram. That's a lot of protein. High, high protein intakes. It will come healthy in protein. And then, yes, these these last two, when you oh, get above yes. two to three, we're talking, I guess, major major increases in in protein as well as trying to make sure you maintain mus muscle mass when you're dieting. That number three there talks about um, this this uh, amount of protein is good for when you're in hypocaloric periods. So if you don't bring in enough calories, you're trying to lose weight by reducing calories. Um, if you don't have the calories, the body's going to cannibalize the muscle. Okay? So if you take in the protein, you can prevent that a little bit. The best proteins for MPS, muscle protein synthesis, are ones that have, are, are, have all your essential amino acids as well as some branch chain amino acids, such as leucine here. Leucine, isoleucine, and what's the third one, glycine? เขาบอกว่าพอดีออพติมอลโดสสําหรับเอ็นพีเอสนะครับทีนี้ก็จริงๆดูว่าอายุนะครับแล้วก็การดิสเทนซ์ครับแล้วก็ตัวที่ต้
ก็เวลาไปหาตัวโปรตีนก็ดูเรื่องของอะมิโนแอซิดนะครับเวลาที่หาตัวสัมพันธ์นะครับ DAA อะไรอ่าไม่รู้ว่า EEAA ก็พูด d c a แต่อาจารย์ว่าอาจารย์ระดิฐาอีเรเซนเชียลอ๋อมโนเอเซนเอเอมาเซอร์โปรตินซินเดซิสยอมมาเซอร์โปรตินซินเดซิสเอเอคือเรเซนเชียลอะมโนเอเซนก็ทำสุดท้ายมันขายบันแล้ว Yeah, you need to have a a pretty good intake of dietary fat to because there's lots of energy in it, lots of energy. It also replenishes your intermuscular triglyceride stores. The 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 fat that we get primarily during exercise is is right near the muscle itself. Those are intramuscular. These muscles, these fat stores, don't have to travel from adipose tissue. They're pretty, pretty uh, rapidly absorbed because they're so close. And then, what kind of thing you need? Right? The one that you need to use is the one that is in the MTG store. Right? 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 Also, a high-fat diet contain uh, allow you to maintain your testosterone levels that are necessary for increased strength production. ก็ขอบอกว่าถ้าตัวของตัวแฟตเตอร์เนี่ยมันจะช่วยในการ maintain ตัวเทสเทสโทรนนะครับ transformation การสิ้นผลนะ Especially if you eat American beef, we have we inject our cows with lots of testosterone, so they grow big and strong. And when we adjust it. We get the testosterone. That's why Americans are so big and strong. We eat lots of beef.
and every few years, every few decades, it comes into popularity again. People forget about it, then they go, hey, here's a good idea, let's try this, and it becomes famous again. And it keeps going in and out of favor. The last big time it was famous was when uh, the Atkins diet became all the rage. And the Atkins diet is just a ketogenic diet. Now it's back again, but we call it the ketogenic diet. Instead of the diabetic diet, instead of the Atkins diet, now we call it the ketogenic diet. But they're all the same thing. The idea to, to get most of your calories from fat and have very, very little carbohydrates. In this example, they, they have as much as 80% from dietary fat and less than 10% from carbohydrate. And the goal is trying to, to uh, turn your body into a fat burner instead of a sugar burner. Unfortunately, most people who use ketogenic diet don't go far enough. They might uh, they go 50% of, of, of fat or 60% even, and they find they really don't get into ketogenesis. So they're not burning ketones, acetone and uh, what's the other one, acetoacetate. They're not actually burning these ketones. They're still burning a lot of the calories from the carbohydrates. Uh, What's happening, is one of the keys is to reduce the number of carbohydrates. Because when you ingest the carbohydrates, okay, like the glucose in the blood, uh, it, inhibits, it inhibits fat being released for energy. So uh, if you have glucose, you can't actually use it. So the idea is to remove glucose from the blood, allow fat stores that have to be used and contribute to your uh, energy needs. I think most of the athletes that use this, they find that once they become truly ketogenic, there's no difference in their performance, and there's no difference in the way they feel compared to uh, an athlete who's on a high carbohydrate diet. And there are successful athletes doing all these diets. Even uh, triathletes, particularly Ironman triathletes, a lot of them are going toward a ketogenic diet now. And the idea is that since it's such a long event, uh, you need lots of lots of fuel, and we have the most of our fuel in our fat stores. So if I can burn fat and and spare the glycogen, then I'm going to be able to go uh, and go the whole marathon, the whole uh, Ironman, without even developing any fatigue. ก็พยายามใช้แรงพลังงานจากไขมันแทนเพื่อที่จะเร่งมีเชื้อเพลิงที่ไปได้ไกลได้นานขึ้นนะครับแต่เขาก็บอกว่ามันเป็นการตอบ
เราไปไหนเราต้องมีข้อเหนียวติดไปด้วยโควไทยไปอะไรต้องมีโควไทยไปด้วยเราไปแข่งกีฬามีส้มตำท่านTrying to determine how much how much you should be drinking, or how much you need to how much water you need to replace from exercise. This point is is the starting point. For every kilogram of body weight that you lose after exercise, you're going to weigh yourself. How much weight did you lose? Most of that is going to be from from water. And one kilogram of body weight, uh, or one liter of water weighs one kilogram. นี่ก็เป็นวิธีการที่มอนิเตอร์ว่าเราสูญเสียน้ำมากน้อยขนาดไหนครับเขาบอกว่าถ้าเราใช้น้ำหนักก่อนแล้วเราเล็กซ์ไซด์นะครับก็ดูว่าถ้าเราหายไปหนึ่งกิโลวัตถุเวทนะครับน้ำหนักตัวจะเท่ากับประมาณหนึ่งลิตรนะครับ Because during exercise here, the most athletes are going to do well with an intake of between 0.4 and 0.8 liters per hour. เขาก็แนะนำให้ตื่นแล้วนะครับอย่างน้อยประมาณ 0.4 นะครึ่งลิตรนะครับต่อชั่วโมง You can see there's a there's a ratio there a range there Personally I've always found I've used the 0.7 liters per hour as my guide and seems to work pretty well for me This is a, a fun new disease that uh, condition that uh, is quite is quite common in triathletes. We've been told that our thirst mechanism doesn't work as well as it should. That our we 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 sweat a lot more, and we're, our thirst mechanism tells us to drink in less than we're sweating. Yeah, and you got 
ชั่นที่เขาบอกเจอในพวกพรรคไตรยิทางเขาเนี่ยก็คือพอเราเหนื่อยเยอะเราก็รู้สึกจะจะหายน้ำครับแต่ตัวเอร์มีการเสียงก็คือตัวความอยากหายน้ำไม่ไม่ดี I don't, I don't believe that's true, but that, that's, that's where we start when we're talking about how much water we should get. And athletes take this idea that, you know, if I drop my body weight by 2%, if I sweat off 2% of my body weight, my aerobic performance is going to go down. So they want to make sure that they keep the water in. <laughs> So a, a triathlete will typically create a drinking schedule. I go, okay, every 15 minutes I want to take in 200 liters of water. And every 15 minutes they take in 200 liters, whether they need it or not. If you're taking a little bit more than you need every 15 minutes, it's going to add up. And result, unfortunate result, in a lot of cases, is a result of hypometremia. Basically, they drown themselves in water, and the concentration of sodium within the, within the cells becomes too low to actually allow uh, depolarization of, of uh, the neurons. <laughs> Bodies can tolerate lack of water a whole lot easier than they can tolerate too much. This suggestion here to take in one and a half, one and a half liters for every kilogram body weight lost. Um, that's after you're done exercising. It's not during during exercise. And the idea is there's going to be you're going to have a continued epoch. You're going to have continued uh, body temperature, and both of those things are going to uh, need a little bit more cooling mechanism going on. So taking a little bit more than one kilogram. You want to reduce your um, exercise needs, your energy needs, for a period of time before your major competition. And during that time, you want to take, continue to take in a normal number of calories, carbohydrates, or might even increase a little bit. to look at is, is uh, I'm not going to differentiate among the different methods. They're all fairly similar, but the number of carbohydrate grams you should be taking in when you're trying to carbolate. And if you look at that number, you can see that it's for the elite or for the highly experienced athlete, 8 to 10 grams. <laughs> ของคาร์โบไฮเดรตเป็นของวิธีการของคาร์โบไฮเดรตที่เยอะมากแต่เราบอกว่าในส่วนที่เป็นเอ่อจะเห็นว่ามันแปลงเป็น 10 กรัมต่อกิโลกรัมนะที่ต้องเอ่อเวลาเขาดูที่กินนะครับ 3,500 กรัมของคาร์โบไฮเดรตนะครับหรือว่าแปลงเป็น 10 uh, but with, with carbaloni, you can you can go up to 1,500 or even 2,000 calories. 
ับคนที่จะได้ทําให้มีชารีเพิ่มขึ้นเป็นพันห้า And if you use the equation that you burn about 100, you burn about 100 calories per every mile that you run, you can kind of get an idea of where this wall comes when you're running a marathon at about 20 miles. ถ้าเกิดเราสามารถคำนวณได้ครับว่าเราใช้พลังงานเท่าไหร่นะครับในตอนที่วิ่งครับเราก็สามารถคำนวณกับตรงนี้ได้ว่าเรากินเท่าไหร่ If you don't carbo load, if you don't have full stores, uh, you're not going 15 miles. You might be only going 10 before you have a deep, so so low uh, glycogen in the body that you just have to slow down because now they're all dependent upon the fats. You will burn a lot slower. But if we don't load, we'll fall and get hot, hot, hot. That's why we don't use fat, fat, fat. Okay. This is a most common. For three days before your competition, you're going to really decrease your 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 workload. You're going to take it down a lot. You're not going to stop completely, but you're going to take it way down, particularly with the intensity. That's the, that's the key. Intensity burns carbohydrates very very fast. So you're going to reduce your intensity for those three days, while you maintain your carbohydrate needs of nine kilograms per nine grams per kilogram. อันนี้ก็เป็นเพราะว่านี้เป็นที่ที่นิยมใช้นะครับก่อนแข่งสามวันนะครับก็ยังลดลดโหลดอินเนสตี้นะครับลดอินเนสตี้ลงแต่ว่าก็ยังเพิ่มนะครับตัวตัวนอร์มอลนั่นเองก็น้อยกว่าคาร์บอยเดตครับประมาณแปดกรัมต่อกิโล So very simply, carb loading is three days reduce reduce work with a nine gram per kilogram intake of carbohydrates. And one of the problems with or challenges with carbohydrate loading is that when you get to the when you get to the starting line, you're going to have all these carbos on carbohydrates on board, and with the stored carbohydrates, you have a lot of water. You store about what, four grams of water per every gram of carbohydrate, so you have all this extra. All this extra water on board as well, so you're going to feel a little sluggish when you start off. But you know, as you get into the race, you're going to burn, you're going to uh, sweat off that water, bring it down to normal body weight, and then you have you take full advantage of the carbo loading routine that you just went through. <laughs> ตอนเริ่มต้นอาจจะรู้สึกว่าอื่นๆหน่อยเพราะว่ามันหมดมาแล้วมีนอกจากขวายแต่ยังมีน้ำมาด้วยนั่นพอวิ่งสักพักแต่ก็เริ่มจะเริ่มใช้ตัวของขาเนี่ยแหละครับ And you need to practice carb loading. You don't want to do it. You know, the first time to do it, you don't want it before the world championships because you don't know how your body's going to respond. We all respond differently, so you need to do it, practice it on lesser competitions throughout the year. So you know exactly how your body responds to carbohydrate loading, and what kind of food you should be taking in. So here's some uh, guidelines that are kind of. Try to wrap all this stuff up. Protein needs uh, aerobic athletes one to six grams per kilogram. You might wonder why uh, a marathoner needs protein because they're you know they're skinny little people. Uh, all they do is burn carbohydrates. But when you're when you're doing so much exercise, that much exercise, they have a tendency to be hypocaloric, and to maintain the muscle mass they need to perform, they need that extra protein. We really don't need to worry too much about fat. We have plenty of fat on board. There's not a whole lot of people with not enough fat to exercise. 
But as always, we're told to watch your saturated fats because those contribute to developing heart disease. How much protein would you ask uh, a 58 kilogram college wrestler to consume every day? If you start with the idea, they're probably uh, they're probably um, moderately trained. One thing I'll start with the six grams per kilogram body weight. เป็นตัวอย่างนะครับสมมุติว่าเป็นอ่าเขาถามนะครับว่าเป็นอาหารสิบแปดกิโลกรัมของนักอ่าหมวยปั้มในมหาลัยนะครับควรจะกินเท่
like which level of the athletes, and then it's our Olympic trials. Not quite the best, but pretty good. <laughs> Anybody can qualify for the trials. It's making the Olympic team that's hard. Okay. Here's an idea that uh, you're going to need, but I haven't seen it anywhere yet in the if you're trying to lose a pound of body, a body fat, or a pound of body weight, because the idea of calories in equals calories out, you need to know how many calories are stored in a pound or a kilogram of fat. Roughly 3,500 calories in a pound of fat. So if you're 10 pounds overweight, you have 35,000 calories waiting to be used or available to burn. อ่าอันนี้ก็เป็นเรื่องของเกิดเกมเป็นตอนใช่ไหมครับเพราะว่าเกิดเกมเป็นตอนใช่ไหมครับเพราะว่าเกิดเกมเป็นตอนใช่